Perfect Stranglers contains graphic and explicit content suitable for mature listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Listening to Perfect Stranglers. My name is Kylie. And I'm Bree. And welcome to our first episode. Yay! This is going to be a podcast about mainly true crime, but kind of all things like weird, paranormal, occult stuff, like right? not opposed to cryptids. Like hi Bigfoot. Right. Totally not opposed to it. Yeah. Um, because I, I firmly believe that Bigfoot's out there and people are going to hate me for it, but I don't care. And mermaids. There's, mermaids? Yes, I think mermaids are real. Sure, sure. <laughs> the, yeah, give me that face. <laughs> but yeah, so two episodes a month is kind of the plan and we will go from there. Brie, why did you, uh, what got you into true crime? Um, well, I've always, actually, it's kind of been um, a progression when I was younger. I was actually way more into like, paranormal which I still am but then it kind of um evolved into a true crime thing kind of in the same vein I guess just I don't know when you get older and you uh kind of become disillusioned about the real world you realize that the real monsters are actually humans 100 percent yeah yeah so humanity is awful (laughs) yes for sure and I I would say the the case that got me really interested in true crime would be the um tate labianca murders which is also referred to as the manson murders Mm -hmm. uh manson family so i just kind of i don't know i've always been uh fascinated with that era like the 60s like hippie peace and love but then just the you know kind of juxtaposition of the like peace and love but then like this horrible like, people didn't lock their doors. It was, like, the idyllic, like, 60s, whatever. And yeah. then, like, all of a sudden this, like, terrible thing happens. I know people who still don't lock their doors. And it's like, are you a psycho? Yeah, don't. Lock your doors. <laughs> lock your freaking doors. And don't keep your windows open no, at night. Uh-uh. Like, I just I just can't. I just don't understand people like that. They, they have way too much faith in humanity, oh, yeah. in right. my opinion. Like, I, like, it's maybe just because I'm so used to, like, being immersed in all of the bad shit like this stuff, but I have no faith faith in humanity being good. Right. I don't either. Th- those people just don't listen to enough true crime, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, need, they need more murder in their lives. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think the Manson family murders, that whole situation fascinates me. That in Waco really oh sure like fascinates me there's a show on Netflix called Waco and it's like in my queue waiting to watch just because I know I need to sit down and really pay it Nicolina says it's really good yeah Um, it's like an an investment of time yeah I would say like the the case that really got me there's a few so I'm also super into paranormal and still very into it like if I could go um ghost hunting like right now I would 100 percent I want to go rando nodding. Do you know what that is? Oh my gosh. So it's like this app, right? And it it shows you, it's like, um, I don't know if I'm going to explain this right, but I'm going to try. So it's like, um, it shows you like voids and what are they called? You had me at voids. <laughs> yeah. And something else. I can't remember what the other one is. Um, but it's like areas with like a lot of like electromagnetic activity or <gasps> is it like a ley line situation where it shows ley lines in the earth uh, and stuff? i'm not familiar with what that is but it's basically like it, you you're okay. supposed to like set an intention and then you like it gives you like coordinates and you go there and it's supposed to like you're supposed to, like okay let's say if i said um my intention is money i would go to this random place where in it, it's a lot of the places are like off the beaten path kind of uh places that like you wouldn't normally go to in your own town mm-hmm. and like you're supposed to find like i don't know it's d- it depends how well you apparently set your intentions but like so it's like using energy to manifest good things to happen to you maybe you'll find a 20 dollar bill maybe you'll find or bad. <laughs> um or bad things <laughs> like 
like there's there's lots of like TikToks um about rando nodding and there's in this one specific TikTok that actually caught my attention about rando nodding was where the I think it was in Seattle and these kids uh went rando nodding and their intention was death. <gasps> and they What the yeah. hell? And so they went and they found along this like sh- this shoreline or whatever of like like a rocky shoreline. They found this suitcase, right? Get the fuck out! So they go and they're like, "Oh my god, what the heck is it? This it there was legit a body in the suitcase." What the? I heard about this. I did. I've heard about this. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, so yeah. Well, obviously, yes. like we're gonna be doing this because that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but also like what the fuck could you imagine like one of my i don't know who i was talking to one of my friends i was talking to where like i have this in my mind i know at some point i'm going to find a box with a body in it or like a baby or something on the side of the road like i just know it's going to happen in my life yeah but uh so the case that got me interested in true crime there's a couple of them one ed Gein because he was born in lacrosse county so that i remember hearing about that and then I like watched like NCIS right. and Forensic Files and stuff like that. But when the Todd Kendhammer case happened in Lacrosse, I watched. I was supposed to be working, and I didn't work at all for like a week. I just watched the trial while I was at work on all three of my screens, <laughs> and I just like sat there and I watched, and I was like, "This is fucking insane." Um, and that's like what really like spurred it for me. And then one of my friends, Mandy, hey, Mandy, yeah. um, she told me to listen to Wine and Crime. And she's like, you need to listen to this. And so I started listening to that. And that's kind of when it all escalated. And it's pretty much taken over my life since then. But yeah, the Todd Kenhammer case really, because it was so close to home. And like we knew people in the community who knew those people. And yeah, that was really a really big one for me. Yep. And we're definitely going to be covering that case in one of our episodes. Oh, we have to because it's like banana sandwich. We have to. Yeah. Yeah. It is banana sandwich like crazy. He is an absolute horrible human being. Yeah. And sociopath. Yeah. He is. Yes. He's an absolute sociopath ever. It's always the ones where they say, oh, he was so nice. I would never imagine it. Their their marriage just seems so perfect. It's like nothing is perfect. See, Some people say that, but I've also talked to somebody who went to high school with Mm -hmm. the guy, so has known him for a really long time, and just, they said that he was always kind of a jerk. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. We totally have to cover this, because he's, yeah, he's just a horrible human being. Yeah, we'll talk about that in, uh, in that episode. So, yeah, I guess we should probably get into the first case here, huh? Yeah, what's our, what do you got for me today? Okay, so this is about a... A monster, an absolute horrible scum of the earth fucking human being. Um, And so, well, we didn't want to start off with like a huge heavy hitter like Gein or Dahmer or anything like that, because I feel like, where do you go from there? So, and I really, so from Wisconsin, and I really wanted to start with a Wisconsin murderer. I sound so Midwestern saying that. (laughs) Wisconsin. (laughs) Wisconsin. But I I did. I wanted to start with a Wisconsin murderer. And so we are going to be talking about David Spanbauer. And he is as horrible as his name is. (laughs) So um, David Frank Spanbauer was born in January of 1941 in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, His family was like standard, Midwestern, blue collar family, Catholic, very religious, very strict. Um, And he was the oldest child of Frank and Evelyn Spanbauer. And then he had two younger sisters. Um, Frank, the dad, was very, very tough on his only son. And they had a very like touch and go relationship. Everything just said that he was very strict with Frank because he was the only boy. Um, And he had the two younger sisters and... Um, yeah, I feel like that's just like with every family though, whoever is the oldest has a lot of pressure on them. And especially if they're the boy of the family, um, I feel like there's just like a lot of pressure on that. And I would hate to be the oldest boy in a family, to be honest with you. So I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, and him being the only son in a blue collar Christian family, obviously we could speculate that his, his childhood was pretty strict and repressive on him um, and giving his crimes that you'll hear coming up I don't think it's a stretch to say that there was a lot of issues growing up in his family I do know that sex was very frowned upon from the research I've done um, anything re- 
talking about sex, um, any type of sex ed, anything like that was very repressed. So his crimes definitely fit that, which is unfortunate, but he's an absolute fucking monster. So it's not surprising. Yeah. And David was 14 when his father passed away from heart problems. So he grew up with his mom and his two younger sisters. So in high school, David pretty much was a shit kid. He got in trouble with the law, wasn't the greatest student, and he actually ended up dropping out of Oshkosh High School when he was 17 and joined the Navy, which, okay, doesn't seem like a good, doesn't seem like a great thing to do when you're a shit kid and you join the Navy. Does just doesn't seem like there's going to be a good outcome with that, but uh, you'll find out. What, so if he was born in He when? was born in 40... 1941. Okay, so when he joined the uh, the Navy, it was like the m- late 50s, maybe? 41 to 51. Like 59. Okay. Yeah, 59-ish. Um, I don't know. I don't do math. I just talk about murder. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> How do you math? Yeah, I don't know. Um, somewhere around there. Um, but yeah, he was 17 when he joined the Navy. And I would generally say that joining the military would be giving someone some type of structure for an out of control teenage boy. Um, But he was honestly just like so off the rails and just a horrible human. He actually ended up being courts martialed three times for being absent without leave and ended up being sent to the brig, which I definitely had to Google. And yeah. the brig is, I did, I was like, what the fuck is that? Um, it's a United States military prison aboard a United States Navy or Coast Guard vessel or at an American Naval or Marine Corps base is what Google's told me. Um, so basically, yeah, he got sent to, to Navy jail for yeah. being absent without leave. Um, and... So after that, he ended up returning home and he attempted to go back to school and complete what he had um, left over in high school and graduate. But he decided that robbing homes was a much better idea. Uh, So on January 3rd, 1960, um, Spambauer broke into his first home and committed his first major crime. And it definitely wasn't his last crime, but it's kind of what um, spiraled everything out of control for him. Uh, He broke into a home in Appleton, Wisconsin, with the intent of robbery, but what he ended up getting was a hunting knife, a bottle of alcohol, cash, a twenty-two handgun, and two diamond rings. Um, And the next night in Nina, Wisconsin, which is like almost in the middle of, it's between Appleton and his hometown of Oshkosh, so most of his crimes take place kind of in that bubble. Kind of in the Green Bay-ish area. Yes, kind of in the Green Bay area. We'll go a little uh, further west in state by Madison a little later on, but a lot of his crimes take place in that area. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, the next night in Nina, which, yeah, was, is between those two cities, he ended up robbing a house with a twenty two handgun that he had stolen the night before, which I think is, like, a little fucked up. It's almost like he needed to, in my mind, like, he needed to rob a home get a weapon to rob other homes. Like he didn't want to pay for a weapon. He right. needed to steal one and then use that to rob more homes. Like Grand Theft um, Auto or something. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> and like, I think it's a bit ballsy to like steal a weapon and then use that to rob other homes. I don't know. Something about that just like really seems fucked up to me. It is yeah. smart. It is also, it is a smart thing to do, which I hate saying. But you know what? Fucking murderers are usually fairly like, resourceful and smart with that shit they are resourceful yeah um which kind of makes me glad that i'm not super resource resourceful and kind of clumsy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's like super ballsy and it seemed like he was really kind of a bit of a loose cannon and not really a huge plan and not a lot of things well thought out except for like the big picture of robbing people Mm -hmm. Um, so the next week in Appleton, Spanbauer's crimes escalated and he ended up sneaking into a house and stealing money. And then the fucker crept into the room of a 13 year old girl who was up studying while her mom was asleep in another room. And he flashed his gun at the girl and ended up taking her and dragging her into the garage and flat out said, I'm going to rape you. Dang. To the girl's face. And this, like, poor, innocent girl just says, what does that mean? A 13-year-old girl being dragged into a fucking garage by this creep of a man. And, like, if you Google pictures of him, he is an absolute horrible-looking human being. Just says, I'm going to rape you. And, like, having a daughter, this gives me the chills. She just says, what does that mean? Like, how fucked up. 
Um, and keep in mind, Spanbauer was only 19 when this happened wow. at this time. Yeah, he was only 19 doing this to a 13-year girl. Wait, so this was only a couple of days later? Yeah. Then, okay, so his, like, gateway crime was just, like, robbing a couple of places, and then he was just like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna rape someone. Yep, I'm gonna just go from, you know, robbing houses to wanting to rape a girl. And, like, I don't know if he didn't know anyone was in the house, and then he went and saw this girl, and in his mind he's like, rape. That seems like a great New, plan. Yeah. That's New plan. That's how to shut yeah. her up. Like, ugh, right. the, the whole thing just pisses me off. But anyway, so yeah, she said, what does that mean? He ended up pistol whipping her twice, and she screamed her head off, and a yeah. passerby heard and came to investigate, and Spambauer ended up running off and headed up to Green Bay. So oh. nothing happened to the girl besides the fact that she, you know, got pistol whipped. Well, that's still terrifying. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, how scary. And then to probably later find out that that was the guy that wanted to rape you, like seeing him in the news, yeah. how messed up. Right. Um, but once in Green Bay, um, his crime spree, spree started escalating again on January 12th, 1960. So he would have been 40, he would have been 19 here again. Um, on January 12th, 1960, a 16-year-old girl um, by the name of Carol Grady was babysitting her cousins while Spanbauer was looking outside of the home, um, watching through the windows like a peeping Tom, basically. Creepy. And he was armed with that twenty two handgun that he had stolen from the first robbery, keeping it with him. Uh, and Spanbauer broke into the home, stole a small amount of cash, and brought Carol into a bedroom. And that is where he bound her to the bed, spread eagle, used a knife to cut her clothes off, and then proceeded to rape her. Ugh. Um, her uncle returned, yep, her uncle returned home and Spanbauer shot him in the face when he saw what was happening. The uncle survived being shot in the fucking face. Wow. I'm surprised how yeah. many people, like, I've heard lots of stories of people being shot in the face or the head and they survive. And that is insane. Yeah, like, I, it has to be, it has to be done, I'm assuming, in, like, the exact spot. Never been shot in the face. Don't plan on it happening, but who fucking plans on being shot in the face? Um, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're, like, David Blaine or something, which, mm -hmm. I hope he listens to this and gets that idea, because I'd like to see it. Because, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see people, like, catch the bullets in their mouth, but, like. Right. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um back on track david blaine gets me distracted because i think he's cute <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so uh yeah um bound to the bed spread eagle and yeah her uncle returned and spanbauer shot him in the face and when he saw what was happening um spanbauer grabbed his shit and escaped from the home with this girl laying on the bed and the uncle shot in the face um, so since the first burglary, burglary in Appleton, Spanbauer kind of floated all around southeast Wisconsin for about six weeks where there was just like a string of robberies in the general like Milwaukee, between Milwaukee and Green Bay, that whole like coast area. Yep. There was just like a string of robberies for six weeks. And he was eventually picked up for carrying a concealed firearm in Sheboygan County on February 16th, 1960. So... During the interrogation, after he was picked up, Spanbar confessed to his crimes, and the judge labeled him as a sexual deviant and sentenced him to 70 years in prison. Wow. Which I feel like is kind of a really long time for, like, what we kind of know that he did. Um, so I think there's a lot of stuff that he did that he hasn't been caught for that people don't know that he's done, like, all of the robberies. Like, who's to say he wasn't robbing people, raping them, and haven't fessed up to it? Um, but, yeah, so he was labeled as a sexual deviant and sentenced to 70 years in prison. So during his time in prison, his mother was... His mother's a fucking bitch. It's just a whore. So his mother was writing... <laughs> She's a whore. So his mother <laughs> wrote to the governor at the time, attempting to get him out of prison at his parole hearings. Um, her reasoning was he raped the girl because she was promiscuous and he was poor. Uh, like, that doesn't... Boo fucking who, bitch. That just because a girl dresses how she wants and acts how she wants does not mean it's an invite to rape. Uh, especially when she's minding her own business in a house and you break into it exactly exactly uh that whole like as a woman 
saying that another girl is promiscuous and like it was basically earned like fuck off fuck off that makes me so mad um and yeah he was by that logic yeah by that logic we should be able to be like uh he had a dumb stupid face so i shot at it you right. know what i mean like right exactly so yeah because she was promiscuous and he was poor i didn't know that your income determined whether or not you could commit crimes yeah i don't know I like don't, i don't get what the have being poor has anything to do with it like i don't get that I don't know. But yeah, she showed up at all of his parole hearings trying to get him out using that logic. Um, her pleas didn't work throughout his time in prison. Uh, he was suspected of having homosexual liaisons, which is like the weirdest phrase, <laughs> um, homosexual liaisons with younger inmates. And he was smart, they said, but he had a temper and he claimed to have absolutely no control over what he couldn't alter. So like these urges, he said that he just couldn't control them. And, uh, the dick also got a prison tattoo of a devil on his forearm, which, okay, <laughs> I guess you are like scum of the earth, earth human being. <laughs> Better get a tattoo of yourself on your forearm, I guess. Very edgy. Fucking, yeah, very, very edgy of him. <laughs> uh, he was released in May of 1972. And so, yeah, those 70 years really came up. 70 years. It really years. came up quick, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He was released in May of 1972, and he actually began going to college. He was living at the Y and seemed to be doing, like, fine, seemed to be a little bit um, rehabilitated. But then, you know what? Sometimes you just need to commit a crime. So how long was he in prison for? How long of his 70 years did he serve? 60, 10, 12. 12, okay. I mean, that's better than what Brock Turner got for raping that girl that unconscious girl yeah yeah must be nice to be a a white boy who has a bright future ahead of him right right yeah so right. what was when he got out uh after 12 years uh and was living at the y then then what happened uh well uh spambauer ended up spending some time in the dane county jail after he let an escaped prisoner borrow his car <laughs> And that prisoner was arrested and basically ratted David out. Um, and for being involved in the robbery case, um, he was actually, he, for being involved in the robbery case and at Dane County Jail, Dane County actually had a work release program. So he was able to be part of a work release program. And what they had him do is, it's uh, this is unreal, he was clean beaches in Madison, a fucking college town, the college town, like, yeah. It was a party town back then. It's a party town now. The college town along Lake Mendota and Lake Monona during the summer. So, like, what happens at a college town where there's beaches? Well, there's women in bikinis. Uh, so, he just spent, like, 13 years in prison. And they said that he couldn't control himself over his sexual urges. And now he's saying that he couldn't control himself over seeing other women in bikinis at the beach. Um, and it was too much for his sexual urges. And later he told psychiatrists that what he did was out of sexual frustration and he simply couldn't wait any longer. Oh, wow. Like, seriously? Ugh. You can't control yourself? Yeah. It's just like beyond my mind to not be able to control yourself for like urges like that. Right. Like, go jack off. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I just don't understand it. Um, but I guess that means I'm not a sociopath or a psychopath. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> Yay, me. Um, and he said to a social social worker that he was asocial and must have been, this is a quote from him, quote, born retarded, is what he said of himself. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, okay, dude, you said it, not me. Um, so the next third part of the timeline is a little bit muddy. Um, I couldn't find if all of this happened during her, his, his work release or not, but I'm assuming it did. Um, if he spent time in Dane County and was out on work release, that means he was doing all of these things and then going back to jail at night. So work release is, um, work release is going back to jail after you're done working. So I'm I'm thinking that this is when all of this happened because there really wasn't a lot of clarification on that. But so on August 12th, uh, Spanbauer abducted a 17-year-old waitress who was out hitchhiking, which in the 70s, that was still considered like kind of safe. Yeah. Um, that was like the hitchhiking times. 
Yeah, it was still considered safe. Yeah. Um, and so he picked her up, whipped out a knife, and while driving her to Token Creek Park, which is like in the Madison area, I believe, um, he said he was going to rape her, and when he's through with her, will run her over with her with his car. Uh, well, oh my God. She, yep. Well, she ended up crying, and then David ended up crying. Oh, it <laughs> tied her up, raped her, and ended up still letting her live. Yeah, could you imagine? Uh, no, like I could not. That would fuck me up. That would fuck me up if I started crying and the person attacking me just started crying. <laughs> like, I just like, I don't like, it's not funny, but it's funny. Cause like, I can picture it in my head. Yeah. Like none of this is funny, but like, <laughs> that's like just weird. It's bizarre. Um, yeah. So this next part of it makes me absolutely livid. Number one and two still happens today in 2020. She told the policeman that he had a tattoo of the devil on his forearm. Forearm, And later when Spanbauer was rounded up as a suspect, she identified him as the man who raped her. And Spanbauer tried to play it all off and said that everything was consensual. No. Yep. Because if the wow. man says it, it's true. Yep, played it off and said that everything was um, considered a, uh, as consensual. The cops didn't really buy it, um, so they went to court, and the jury found him guilty for abduction and rape, and the assistant district attorney, John Barr, asked for the maximum sentence of 50 years on top of what Spambauer would receive for violating his parole. With all of the facts of this case before him, Judge Ripper, Richard Bardwell responded that the rape was, get ready, much more mild than Spanbauer's previous rape, the one where he tied the victim down, spread evil, raped her at knife point, and then shot a man in the face with a stolen gun. Therefore, the judge figured Spanbauer had moved on from being, quote, a very dangerous sex offender to now merely just, just dangerous. So there has been some improvement. I would... I Are would you say there's not imp- that's 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 something a rapist that's, would say that yes yes exactly like uh, that blows my mind and like shit like that still happens like nothing's really changed you know what I mean like yeah there's a reason women don't like say what happens to them there's a reason women don't report sexual assault it's because no one fucking right. believes them and if they do it well it wasn't that bad you were dressed this way you were acting this way it's awful. Oh, it just all makes me so mad. Yes. So um, that's what the judge said. And Bardwell gave Spambauer 12 years in prison. Then that ran concurrent with his revoked parole. And the girl, in effect, was asking for it, said Bardwell, the judge. They are tempting fate when they do it, which means hitchhiking. Um, fuck you. No, you're not tempting fate. and You're not asking to be raped, you fuckwad. Right. So, Assistant District Attorney Burr thought Spanbauer was a threat to society and was enraged by the light sentence. Burr later said that Spanbauer was in the top 10 of the most vicious and violent people I have ever had the displeasure of coming in contact with. So, at least someone had their head on straight with that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, from that point, Spanbauer met a woman that he planned to marry. I couldn't find any existence of this woman, so I don't know if that's true or not. But he said that he met a woman, planned to marry her, and live with her, and continue to try and get early parole. The parole board refused to parole him until his actual release date on January 29th, 1991. He had um, $8,000 to his name from work release and wound up moving in with his sister, who had just married a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> yeah um so once he got settled in with an actual job at the local seven up bottling plant he moved into an apartment of his own on the west side of oshkosh so he went from back from madison um from madison back to the uh to his hometown east side of the state yep. yep um so this was the longest stretch of freedom that spanbauer would ever have been allowed um and it allowed him the time and space to finally act on all of those sexual urges that he was having while he was in the prison and doing work release um so this is kind of where shit gets real okay as if it hasn't already <laughs> so um 20 year old Lori depies in some type some sites i saw called her laura and some said Lori, um which is like a weird a weird thing so i'm gonna call her Lori. okay so 20-year-old Lori DePies, who lived in winnicomb wisconsin she worked at the fox river mall in grand chute 
and on August 19th, 1992, a week after Spanbauer started his vacation in Winnicom, after finishing, um, so after finishing her shift at the mall, she went to go visit a friend in Menasha, but she never showed up. The friend said that she just never showed up to the place, and her car was found by her friends in their apartment parking lot, still locked. And she is actually still missing. Um, she's still missing, though there was a man, Larry Dewayne, who allegedly confessed to her kidnapping. But um, there's still a lot of things up in the air on that of whether he actually did it or not, which I think is really interesting. Um, so maybe that's like for another episode is like a disappearance episode or something um, on her because, yeah, he says that he did it. But um, I mean, he was in the area. Spanbar was in the area when that happened. So I'm not really sure, but I would like to look more into that. Um, but yeah, she's still missing. And then on August 23rd, 1992... A 10-year-old girl named Ronell Eichstead, I believe. Um, so Ronell went missing, and her bicycle was found next to her home in Ripon in Fond du Lac County. It's a super rural area. And her her body was found six weeks later, miles away from her home. And Ronell's body was found in a cornfield ditch near Tower Hill State Park, kind of close to the Wisconsin River. And then on July 3rd, a 24-year-old Illinois woman who is the target of an attempted abduction by Spanbauer um, near a uh, Hartman Creek State Park in Wapaka, Wisconsin, or in Wapaka County, um, that same day, Spanbauer burglarized a home in an Appleton residence. And then uh, a few days later, on July 9th, Spanbauer breaks into a home he thought was unoccupied. He says he's a 21-year-old girl named Trudy in a bedroom and just shoots her to death. Ugh. Man, he was like, and at this point, busy fucking people's yep. shit up, like, left and right. Oh, my God. Yep, just one after the other after the other. And so he still hasn't been caught at this point. And then on September 5th, 12-year-old Cora Jones was riding her bike again, a girl on a bike, was riding her bike near her grandma's home in Wapaka. Um, he got Cora into his car, and keep in mind she's 12, got Cora into his car and raped her, then drove 75 miles north up to uh, Langlade County near Kempster, Wisconsin. Um, after six hours of doing whatever he was doing to her, uh, Spanbauer strangled her and stabbed Cora and threw her body in a ditch. Aww. Police and the... Mm -hmm, I know. Police and the FBI organized a search for the missing girl, and hundreds of volunteers helped... Um, searched the surrounding woods and a 10 mile perimeter and her body was recovered five days later after um two guys who were hunting discovered her body poor thing so after that on october 13th he burglarizes a home in appleton october 20th a 15 year old girl is sexually assaulted in her home in appleton november 5th a 31 year old woman is sexually assaulted november 14th finally spanbauer is arrested in combined locks which i was like what the fuck is that it's a city <laughs> called yeah. combined locks i've heard of it i don't know where it is but i've heard of it yeah so it's like one right after the other september 5th october 13th october 20th november 5th he just like keeps going and he's getting bolder and everything is getting closer and closer together with dates of what he's doing like he's getting cocky is what he's doing and he's oh, yeah. gonna fuck up yeah not that i am encouraging people to do crimes but don't get cocky right <laughs> <laughs> like like you have to be like don't get with anything like don't be cocky because you're gonna fuck up um, so yeah, on November 14th, Spanbauer is arrested in combined locks just outside of Appleton after attempting to break into a residence. Um, Spanbauer was tackled by the homeowner, G <laughs> Gerald Argall, and I want to think that he was a really old man. I'm not sure, but in my mind, he's like a really old man. That's an old man um, name. Yes. <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, he was tackled by Gerald after fleeing on foot from behind his house. So um, he's in jail, he's being interrogated, and on November 15th, Spambar confesses to an attempted abduction near um, Hartman Creek. Um, he's interrogated a little bit more. On November 18th, Spambar confesses to the Eichstead, to the Eichstead, the Rennell, and um, the Cora Jones, all of those rapes and murders. So yeah, so he confesses to those three murders and the sexual assaults, all of those sexual assaults in Appleton that were suspected to be him, but they weren't really sure. So yeah, he just flat out confessed to everything. Um, and on December 20th, Spanbauer is sentenced to three consecutive life terms plus 403 years in prison. Wow. I know. 
I was not expecting it to be that much. Like when I was doing my research for this case, I was like, there's no way that they're going to um, actually give him what they deserve. Because I feel like so many times you read about this stuff that you don't, you don't hear of anyone getting what they deserve. But yeah, so Rennell, Trudy, and Cora Jones, he confessed to all of those and um, the sexual assaults. And yeah, three life terms plus 403 years. Uh, the sad thing is, is if he had served his 70 years... Yep. Uh, you know... None of this would have fucking happened. Exactly. Right. So, and that happens all the time. All the in time. In our legal system. Like, can we just get people who are in jail for, like, petty shit like pot out and put these people in there, please? Yeah. Because, like, that's, like, a, for a whole different story, but, like, really, come on. It just makes me mad that this, none of this could have, like, none of this should have happened. If he was in prison for the time he was supposed to be, none of this would have happened. And it's just, like, so sad. Is he still living? We'll get to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was creepy as fuck. Um, so, <laughs> so, Dodge County, we'll get to it right now. Um, Dodge County Coroner, um, John, don't know how to say his last name, Bergbatcher, I don't know, um, said Spanbauer 61 was pronounced dead at 4.25 p.m. on July 29th, 2002 from complications of heart and liver disease at the age of 61. And he had apparently signed a DNR, so a do not resuscitate form at the request, or and that request was followed through and no one ended up claiming his body and there is no funeral at all. There's just nothing. This, like, a dead body, let's bury it, and we're done. Which is honestly what he deserves. Yeah. Um, I, I wish I knew, like, what his mom and his sisters had to say about all of this, but, and I looked, and I couldn't find a single peep other than his mom being a bitch and saying promiscuous women deserve to be raped. Um, so, yeah. That night, the night that Spanbauer died, Rick Jones, the father of Cora Jones, the one who is the 12-year-old that um, got stabbed and strangled in his car after being raped, um, said, at least my tax money is no longer going to keep him alive. I always look at my chuck stub at taxes at night, and I always thought that I was paying for health care for the guy who killed my daughter. There will be no party tonight. Which gives me chills wow. just saying that. Yes. Like, absolute chills. Um, so, yeah, that is the absolute monster that is David Spanbauer. Wow, what a piece of shit. And, and like, I can't believe, like, not a lot of people have heard of him. I have never heard of him. No, and he, like, ran rampant in the eastern side of Wisconsin for a long time, doing robbing and raping and murdering, shooting a guy in the face, strangling girls, like, you know what I mean? And then there's that girl that is still missing to this day, and that, that one guy confessed to it, but there's such a huge discrepancy on if he confessed just to confess, because that happens, um, or if Spambauer actually did it, because there's... I mean, Spanbauer was in the city at that time. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. I definitely want to look into that a little bit further down the road. But, yeah, that's uh, that's David Spanbauer, and I am glad he's dead. I'm glad no one paid, or no one claimed his body. So, yeah, I don't know what happened to his body. I'm assuming they just, like, buried it in some random, um, some random... I want to say, why am I wanting to say we buried him in a parking lot? I don't know why that's where my mind is at. <laughs> they buried him in a parking lot. Um, yeah, they must have just like buried him somewhere. Maybe they cremated him. I don't know. I imagine the state would have done something with his body. So cremation is obviously the cheapest option. Right. Maybe he's sitting on a shelf somewhere. <laughs> I'm hoping that they just like cremated his ashes and just like threw him in the trash. It flushed him down the toilet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Flushed him down a dirty prison toilet because that's exactly what he deserves. Yes, he does. So at the end of each uh, episode, we kind of want to do this thing where we want to get viewers um, or viewers because you're watching us listeners stories and like the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you. So paranormal, true crime, just like a creepy thing that's happened to you where you sitting in a parking lot and a dude came up to your car and knocked on the window because that's definitely happened to me. Um, just have you seen Bigfoot? Do you know that mermaids exist? I want to know your thoughts on these things, people. Um, so yeah, I think, Brianna, were you going to start off with the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you? Absolutely. I'm excited. So, I don't know what it is, and I'm stoked. <laughs> okay. So I actually, um, I, I actually told this story in a job interview once because 
they asked me to tell them they asked me to tell them what is the what is tell me they just said tell me a story is like the weirdest interview ever right the, like, that is wild for what job <laughs> for it was for a um like a visual marketing type assistant type thing for um Duluth Trading Interesting. Corporate. Interesting. Okay. And one of their like um you know their Duluth culture uh items is uh storytelling. So that's kind of how it played in. So she okay. she just said tell me a story. Any story. Okay. So this is the I don't I don't know. This is the story that that I thought of. So, all right. It's the weird it's one of the weirdest things that's ever happened to me. Um, so I was 16 years old. Um, my best friend Chelsea had moved to Chippewa Falls. So about mm, a little over an hour away. I was visiting her. She lived with her mom. I was visiting her for the weekend and we, um, just did typical, you know, 16 year old girl things. We caught up, we went to the movie theater um, and then on, uh, I believe on Saturday, we were just kind of looking for something to do. And we had seen that, uh, down the street, one of the neighbors, um, had a rummage sale going on. So, uh, we just, it was a, it was a little bit further down the street. It was like a block away. So such a Midwestern being... thing to do is to, oh, let's go to the rummage sales. Right. Right? Like Midwestern culture is like at its peak with that. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> we were just, we were like, hey, maybe, you know, maybe we can find some like movies or like something like that. So yep. um, we drove down there um, and we were looking around and this truck, kind of beat up truck pulls up and this guy gets out. He was kind of, he was a taller guy. He was a younger guy. I was, I would say he was probably in his early 20s um he was a little intimidating just because he was very tall and he uh he had a fresh tattoo on his arm like and it was of a cadillac symbol but <laughs> he didn't drive up in a cadillac so how trashy yeah i don't know it was still like um shiny with the a and d ointment like it was fresh uh, you could yep. tell yep and um yeah, that was, it was a little weird. He, he looked, he looked kind of, you know, he looked kind of trashy. Um, yeah, and he I was know the tr- look. Yeah. So we were, and he was. Wisconsin trashy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so he started to try to like talk with us and kind of try to flirt with us, which was very uncomfortable because, um, like neither of us, we were like the shy girls, like nobody paid attention to us. Like we never had boyfriends. Like, so we were just honestly a little creeped out that this like very tall kind of trashy older guy was like trying to be like cutesy with us. Oh, that's the worst. Like, no, thank you. Yeah. Like me and my best friend, we feel like we kind of have ESP. So like, I kind of knew that, like, we both were trying to, like, kind of get out of there without being, like, obviously, like, look like we were freaked out. We were just trying to, like, casually be like, okay, yeah, uh, Yeah. now we're done with this rummage sale. Women have Um, that. I feel like close friends have that. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And we have been friends since we were five years old. So, like, we grew up together. So this guy, he's trying, he, there's, okay. At the rummage sale, they were selling, like, a bunch of, uh, like, stuffed animals, like, toy stuffed animals. Um, and there was this really, really ugly, like, cheaply made, generic, like, you almost can't tell what kind of an animal it's supposed to be, uh, stuffed animal. And I think it was a cat. It was being sold for 25 cents. And, um, so he picked it up and he, and he was talking to me. He's like, this guy's pretty cute. He needs a good home. Why don't you take this home with you? And I was like, Oh yeah, I don't, uh, I don't like, I didn't know what to say. What a fucking And so he, yeah. And so he gave the lady who was running the rummage sale a quarter and then gave that to me. Like, 
here you go, sweetheart. Like, and how old were you? I was 16. Okay. So that's creepy as fuck. Yeah. Like, you're, are you really, like, 20-something and you're, tr- you're picking, first of all, you're picking someone up at a <laughs> rummage sale? I never thought about that. <laughs> you're picking someone up, uh, you're picking up a minor at a rummage sale and you're gifting her an old, ugly-ass 25-cent cat? <gasps> oh my god! Stuffed animal? Like, the, the, what the fuck? What the fuck, yeah. So, that's not even the weird part, okay? Um, so... I take this cat, we get into Chelsea's car, and we're just kind of, like, giggling, like, that was a weird experience, like, what in the hell? And so, um, so I'm like, I don't want this, like, what, what, she, what are we gonna do with this? Like, I don't want this. Like, <laughs> so she's like, all right, I'm gonna drive a few blocks away, I'm gonna turn a couple corners, and then you roll down your window and just... And just throw it out the window, and then we'll just drive away. Like, just yeah, goofy teenager. Yeah. <laughs> so we did that, right? And she drives away, and we're giggling and whatever. And then we, you know, we went home. We went back to her house, uh, continued on with our weekend. And then Sunday, Sunday morning, which would be the next morning, I was going to make my way home. And so she went out... Uh, with me, uh, to, to walk me out, help me bring my bag out and everything like that. And her car was parked, uh, in front of their house, uh, next to the curb. And she for I think she forgot her like sunglasses or something like that. She was going to come with yeah. me. Um, so in front of her car, she goes back in, okay, comes back out and I'm like staring at in disbelief. I'm like, uh, Chelsea, Look in front of your car. <gasps> Did you put that there? And the freaking cat thing. No. The stuffed animal cat was sitting in the f- no. in front of the grill of her car. No. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. So I'm like, no, thank you. We, so we were like really creeped out. Um, Like, sh- like, was he following us? Like, like, he obviously knows what her car looked like because it was parked at the rummage sale because that's what we drove there. Right. But how would he have known that that's your car? Unless you were the only people at the rummage yeah, sale? Yeah, we were the only people at the rummage sale. Okay. Okay. Um. Oh, my but, God. But, like, we drove away and, like, we wanted to make sure that nobody saw us. And we would have, like, yeah. like he'd, he hadn't left the rummage sale. Like, he was still at the rummage sale when we were. And we tried to purposely drive weird ways so he wouldn't know where her house was, where we were driving back to. Oh my god, I hate it. So I, we don't know if, if it was him. We didn't know if it was, like, a neighbor that was like, you kids littering, I'm gonna give this back to you. Or, like, we... It was very weird. That is so bizarre, so weird. I, like, yeah, maybe it could have been a neighbor, like, seeing you whip the the bear out of the car. It was blocks away and around a couple of corners, though. Right. So how far away was your car parked from where the rummage sale was? Uh, it was like a street or two. It was like, it was like literally down the same street. Okay. Like one or two blocks. I bet you it was, it was at least two blocks down. Okay. So yeah, the guy totally could have like saw the... Stuff the animal thrown out, drove around, looked for your car, and placed it there. Or, like, a neighbor totally could have done it. But I just, like, you throwing the... I'm just, like, picturing you driving, throwing the bear out. That takes a split second to do. Like, someone would have to look at the exact perfect and then time to see that happen. Be in, Probably... Put it in front of be the... Be in a car following us, then. Right. And put it in front of the exact, like, right vehicle. Yeah. I just... I don't... Yeah, I am. Yeah, um, I don't know what to say. It has to be the guy, the creepy I know. fucking guy. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, that is bizarre and disturbing. Disturbing. And, and so, yeah. in my interview, when I told that story, <laughs> the the lady who asked me, she was like, kind of stunned and a little speechless, and she was like, "That." Yeah. She's like, "I've asked this question to tell a story in a lot of interviews, and that's." the best story i've heard from asking that question <laughs> i i mean yeah that is that is 
creepy and like yeah you said it in the be- very beginning of this humans are the like real creeps yes of everything like humans are awful yes and that like this stuff like that and like david spanbauer and yeah it yes. just proves it so if any of our listeners out there have any strange stories uh about anything strange that's happened to you please email us at perfect stranglers podcast at gmail.com and you might hear your story on our podcast yes i want to know them i want to know all of them the weird the paranormal the true crime the creepy guys doing this which isn't really a crime but it's just a guy being creepy i want to know it all i yeah i want to know it all but yeah thank you guys for listening and yeah we'll be uploading uh i think twice a Mm -hmm. month um and you can follow us on social media instagram is perfect stranglers facebook perfect stranglers probably will be getting a twitter at some point but i'm 90 and don't know how to use twitter (laughs) so we'll figure that out when it comes when it comes to it um so yeah everyone thank you for listening thank you much